Uh, okay, you should be able to share your screen. Let's just quickly check that, and then we'll we'll begin. Yeah, this. let's a take a look here. at. Uh, probably I should first open the presentation on my computer. <laughs> that would be a first step. step. Yeah. Okay, let me now share the screen. Let's see. Screen two. Yeah, are you able to see the presentation? Yep. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. All right. I think we should uh, we should just begin. Um, so uh, we're super happy to have uh, Noor from the Graduate Institute at Geneva. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, political competition and infant mortality. So yeah, please begin. Good. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm I'm very happy to have the feeling that I'm uh, I'm in India, and I'm definitely at the end of uh, of the seminar. Going across the street, there is a small Indian restaurant to get uh, to get some nice Indian food. To completely have the feeling that I've been for a bit in India. So uh, the title of the paper is indeed the political competition over life and death: evidence from infant mortality in India. So this is joint work with Anders Kjellsrud and Kali Muna who uh, both of you, uh, all of you definitely know uh, because they've systematically been coming um, to the conference, uh, the ISI conference in December. Um, so they're both based at the University of, uh, of Oslo in Norway. Yeah, so this paper, what we're basically doing is, is uh, we're gonna be taking a look at a child survival. Okay, so the first important um, observation is that child survival improved a lot over the last three decades. So if you take a look at worldwide numbers, the total deaths of children under five actually fell from about 12.5 million in 1990 to 5.3 million in 2018. But if you then start comparing countries, if you also start looking within countries, then you actually see that there is a lot of variation. Okay, so there's a lot of variation in terms of the number of children that are dying, and especially if you take a look at children who die from preventable diseases. So the big question that we're asking in this paper is what actually explains the huge variation in these what we call um, unnecessary deaths. And the aspect that we're going to be taking a look at is the political economy, in the sense that we're going to be studying the role of income inequality and political competition and explaining the variation in child mortality that you observe within um, India. So uh, what's our hypothesis? So we've, we've built a small short model to actually put the hypothesis uh, forward. I will not go into the details today because as you will see, the empirics is, uh, is already quite a bit. And uh, given I only have one hour, I want to be sure that at least one of the two parts can be done um, in detail. So, but the idea that we have in mind or the, the key channel through which we feel that economic inequality affects health is actually the provision of healthcare. So take a, take a particular area, take the average income. The demand for public healthcare is typically, typically going to be higher among the poor than among the rich. And the main idea here is that the rich may have alternatives. They can go to the district headquarters uh, to visit a private hospital. So they may not be as much in need of, of public health care as, as the poor people. So inequality may then actually generate a conflict of interest. So imagine that there's only a little bit of political competition. So if that is the case and you have a higher inequality, it means that the rich actually have more political influence this would lead to less public provision of healthcare, and then as a result of that, a worse average health. If on the contrary, there is a fierce political competition, it becomes very risky for the politician to cater for non-majoritarian interests because then they may lose the next, the next elections. So if there is a fierce political competition, even if it is combined and with higher inequality, what we're actually going to observe or what we feel or what, we, what the hypothesis is that we put forward is that if this is the case, then they will still want to cater for the poor and actually this negative impact of inequality on public provision will kind of be less pronounced. So in other words, way, another way of saying it is that there is a negative effect of inequality on health outcomes, but this can actually be mitigated by a higher level of political competition. And this is, this is the hypothesis that, that we will be investigating um, in this paper. So what is, the, what is the 
correlation or what is the link between inequality on the one hand and health outcomes and then what is the role of political um, competition to mitigate uh, the negative effect. So the paper in a nutshell, so the main outcome variables are neonatal and post-neonatal um, infant mortality. So we will claim or we will definitely try to go beyond purely correlations and we will come up with an identification that we believe um, allows us to make some causal claims. And what we exploit to do that is uh, the large redistricting of electoral boundaries in India, the so-called delimitation. So the last delimitation happened in 2008 and basically a quarter of voters were shifted to new constituencies. And the shift of voters to new constituencies is what we actually will be using to identify the impact of inequality and of political competition on, um, on health outcomes. So the main finding confirms our hypothesis. So inequality causes more post-neonatal infant deaths, but it only does so in situations where there is a lack of political competition. Okay, so we're not only gonna be taking a look at, at uh, health outcomes, so we will provide some additional evidence that can support our hypothesis. So first of all, we will be taking a look at, at the demand and the supply of public healthcare. So we will see that uh, government health centers are located in constituencies with a low political competition, high inequality, that those actually have fewer staff and provide less services um, to, um, to the people that fall under their, uh, under their responsibility. And we will also show that our me mechanism is relevant for a wider range of social provisions. And the one that we're gonna be focusing on is uh, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural, Rural Employment Guarantee Act. So there again, we actually will find that it is better implemented in areas where uh, political, political competition is higher. And then uh, what I will not show today, but in the paper, we also actually um, took a look uh, using some cross uh, sectional data at what happens more widely um, if you take a look at a sample of low and middle income countries. And again, we actually can confirm the, uh, the exact same pattern. Okay, uh, so feel free to interrupt. Ah, there is a question. I was just gonna say, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, hi, Laura. Um, Hello. Just, uh, so you mentioned that there's an effect on post neonatal infant deaths, but mm -hmm. What about neonatal infant deaths? No, there's not gonna be an impact there. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So I will be discussing the difference between the two. Also the, the main motivation that we had to look differently at both age groups is because um, there's a lot of low hanging fruit if you want to improve post neonatal infant deaths. So these it's children mainly die because of diarrhea, pneumonia, diseases that can be avoided through vaccinations. So it's actually quite easy if you want to reduce uh, the deaths there. If you then take a look at neonatal infant deaths, it's a bit harder. So a lot of that is actually linked to, um, or, or to avoid more of those, uh, those deaths. What you need is much more individual clinical care. And that's the main reason why we split between the two. We actually take a look at the supply in the sense of, of healthcare. So what are the services that are provided? And there we see that there is an improvement for both. So I actually do see that um, there is an increase in services also related to uh, neonatal deaths. So there is um, more women are uh, registered in the first trimester. We're seeing that there's more post neonatal care uh, provided, but we actually do not see the reduction in terms of the number of deaths. And the explanation that we put forward is that it's actually much more demanding that it's harder to avoid if you want uh, children dying within the first month. But, but uh, I have a, I, just a clarificatory question. Uh, hello? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, one clarification, but wouldn't it be, uh, I mean, isn't it necessary that institutions matter much for, more for neonatal death than for, you know, in post neonatal term, environmental factors, family, many other things matter. Mm -hmm. But for neonatal death, institutions play an important role, right? Which is where I would have imagined that political competition would have played a much bigger role in some sense. Mm. So we argue it's the case for both because even, even like the main reason why children die before the, the age of five today is still diarrhea which we know can very easily be solved by, by giving them ORS, for example. And so 
that's one of the that's one of the reasons why we're basically putting forward that it it is important for both um but the, the main difference between the two and that i definitely agree on is that somehow it's easier for post neonatal than than neonatal deaths but but so, also the the other clarification would be that most deaths uh, most children deaths infant deaths are neonatal right almost 70 to 80 percent of deaths are yes uh, exactly neonatal. if you take a look at the absolute numbers it's it's indeed it's similar um, yeah. But it's indeed the case that, that neonatal is in the first month, while postneonatal is, is in. We're taking a look at the first year, so after month one and before the first year. Oh, so, of course, that's another 11 months. Um, but then the number of children we're observing that are dying in the sample is actually, in absolute terms, it's, it's very close to one another. Okay. But it's indeed the case that given we're comparing one month and 11 months, it's, it's different in relative terms. Okay. Thank you. But, um, but I'll definitely, I mean, I'm very happy to come back to that uh, when, when, when we discuss, uh, when I reach that uh, stage of sure. the, the presentation. Sure. So um, in terms of contribution, um, so first of all, uh, we contributed the literature on how inequality affects the distribution of power in a society. So the main idea here is that um, to articulate collective demands um, that requires coordination that can be much harder for a bigger group of poor people than it is for a small group of rich people. Um, so papers already within that literature, of course, Barden and Mukherjee 2000, and then also work by uh, Jean-Marie Ballon and Jean-Philippe Plateau. Then there's the em empirical literature on the effects of inequality on, on health. So the aspect that our paper contributes there is by focusing much more on the political economy of, uh, of public health spending. Then uh, there are quite some papers that have been looking at the effect of democratization on health and government healthcare spending. So the difference that we're making there is that we're basically more taking a look at the intensive margin than the extensive margin. So we're taking a look within the context of India, which is a democracy, but then there are still um, changes at the intensive margin in terms of the, the, the fierceness of political competition. And then we're definitely not the only paper that started using redistrict, redistricting as an identification. So uh, Barden and Coulters have a paper in 2008, one of the PhD, their PhD students, Nat's paper in 2014. And then there is a Francesca Insigne's paper in, in 2016. Um, so let me start with giving some background information. So I think the first aspect, the first element of that I can actually go very quickly over because you all definitely know the Indian electoral system much better than I do. But just for completeness, completeness so there are four administrative levels, the states, the districts, the sub-districts, and then finally the villages wards. Uh, they're first past the post elections at five different levels. Uh, the one that we will mainly be looking at is, is the lower house of the parliament, so the Lok Sabha. Then you have the state assembly, again, district, sub-district and village council. And then uh, the national and state level bodies that are responsible, uh, are mainly responsible for legislation. But much of the development planning is done at the lower levels and then mainly, uh, mainly refer to, to the district. So let me already point this out now, given that the district plays such an important role in public good provision, throughout what we will be doing in terms of the empirics, there will always be district fixed effects to actually take that uh, into account. But I'll come back to that when I explain uh, our exact identification. Um, so as I said, we will be focusing on electoral competition at the parliamentary level. So India is divided into uh, 543 parliamentary constituencies, uh, which are drawn by the Delimitation Commission. PCs do not cross state borders, but they actually can cross the boundaries of administrative districts, which is also going to be important for our identification. And then there's one member of parliament elected in each of those uh, constituencies. So one important aspect is to actually put forward why we believe that uh, those members of parliaments are actually a relevant body to, to look at. So first of all, um, health is a recurrent topic in parliament. So uh, we took a look at the digital library to, to, to see what uh, topics are included in the speeches of the MPs and health is actually um, as important or is as often mentioned as employment and unemployment combined. If you compare it, for example, to the provision of water, it's actually three times as important. Okay, so health is definitely, some, it's definitely a topic that is on the, on the agenda. 
then these members of parliament are also ex officio members of the district level councils in their uh, PC. So they can basically attend the meetings if they want, they can ask for the, um, the, the meeting notes, etc. So they have a yearly budget that is to be spent in their uh, constituency. So this is called the Members of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme that over time actually became more and more important. So its size has increased about 100 times since it was initiated in uh, 1993. And it currently is about 5 million rupees per year that they actually have available. So if you then take a look at the type of uh, projects that they have been implementing, then aspects such as the purchase of ambulances, equipment for local clinics are, uh, are part of that. So then the final reason why uh, we believe that the MPs play an important role in local um, health healthcare is that they're uh, affecting outcomes at local levels through informal channels, such as, for example, pressuring local bureaucrats. So uh, Maheshwari studied this at the 70s, so that's uh, of course quite some time ago, but then concluded that MPs spent a considerable time handling requests from their constituents, and most requests actually fell within the state jurisdiction. Um, then much more recently, uh, Jennifer Bussell uh, in 2018 wrote a book that finds that MPs in Bihar, in Jharkhand, and in Uttar Pradesh spent close to a quarter of their time um, meeting with with their constituents so it's definitely not the it's definitely the case that they get quite involved into uh local policy making and that includes uh the provision of local health care okay so uh the main aspect that we will be using for identification is the delimitation act of 2008 so the first this was actually uh the first redistriction redistricting since uh the 1970s and the main reason why it had been put on hold is that the, the idea of the delimitation is that you want to keep, that you want to try to keep the population within a certain constituency stable over time. So of course what happens is that if, if there are higher birth rates in a particular constituency, that this constituency may actually be split. And the effect of that would be that, that some perversive uh, incentives, perverse incentives are given to the implementation of family planning programs. And that was the main reason why in the 1970s they decided to actually put this redistricting on hold. And then the first one that, that, that happened again was, was in 2008 only. So as a result, of course, a lot of reshuffling has, has happened. And on average, it's about one quarter of the, of the population of India that was actually shifted into a new uh, constituency. So I said the goal is mainly to equalize the population across different constituencies within states, and at the same time to redemarcate uh, the constituencies that have to be reserved for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So uh, the main restrictions are basically two is first of all, that the number of PCs per state, that has to remain the same. So it's not the case, case that the state certainly would get more constituencies. And also they have to be geographically compact and contiguous. So if there are mountain ranges, they will not be in the middle of a, of a constituency, but it will demarcate the border of uh, a constituency. So what our empirical strategy is gonna exploit is the exogenous variation in political competition and inequality that is actually induced by these, uh, by these boundary changes. And then there are multiple ways, I will come back to that, but there are multiple ways in which we're actually trying to defend that uh, this was exogenous um, indeed. So um, the first thing that we then of course have to do is to take a look at whether there was any gerrymandering at the moment that these new borders were actually, uh, were actually um, drawn. So first of all, it's important to know that the delimitation was organized by an independent uh, commission. So let me give you a little bit more detail. So this commission, that's um, a three member commission in each of the states. So it's a former Supreme Court judge, a chief election commissioner of India, and then the state election commissioner. And then in addition to this group, there are some associate members. So this includes five members of parliament and also five uh, MLAs from each state. So they don't have a power, a voting power in the final decision, but they actually can give advice. So they can say what is positive uh, or, or if there are things that they feel that should be uh, changed. So uh, this was started in July 2004. That is right after the 2004 parliamentary election. And it's based on the 2001 census. So it's a 2001 census that informed them about the population in the, in the different constituencies. 
So there were a bunch of meetings with the associate members and then a first draft was published in 2006, 2007 that could be publicly commented. And then the final report was approved in August 2008 by, uh, by the president. Good, so of course the consensus view is that it was carried out with great influence uh, from uh, incumbent politicians but uh, without great influence from incumbent politicians. And then a number of, of authors have actually taken a look at whether or not that is the case. So the first ones were Ayer and Reddy in uh, 2013. They took a look at the redistricting in just Andhra Pradesh uh, and, uh, and Rajasthan. And then Barden and Quarters took a look in, in West Bengal at whether, um, whether there are reasons to believe that there was any gerrymandering going on. So they concluded that was not the case. So what we did here is we followed the exact same an analysis as IR and Ready 2013, but instead of just taking a look at the number of states, we're actually taking doing the exercise for all the states of, of India. So the first test that, uh, that they did is that the smallest and the largest constituencies, they are more likely to be redistricted. So given that the purpose is to have the same population in each of the constituencies or as similar as possible. This basically implies that the smallest and the largest ones should see the, the biggest change. And that is indeed the case. So then the most influential incumbent politicians are obviously these associate members that are the first ones who can give some comments on what is exactly going on. So they take a look at whether or not they uh, experience some ex ante more favorable redistricting in their particular constituencies. So the different aspects that they took a look at is, first of all, the percentage increase in the number of eligible voters. Second, the fraction of voters in the new constituency that were part of the original constituency. And then finally, the likelihood that the constituencies changed reservation status, which potentially could imply that they actually could not rerun for election. And basically, you don't see any difference between the constituencies that had an associate member sitting on the committee and constituencies that did not have such a member. Okay, so in that sense, um, we actually confirm what the others had found and basically saying that even for India as a whole, it actually looks like uh, there was no gerrymandering into, in the, into the process. And in that sense, just the placement of the borders or the changes of the borders uh, can be considered to a certain extent to be exogenous. So uh, what are the different data sources that we're using in our uh, analysis? So first of all, there is a 2015-16 National Family and Health Survey. This is, is basically the Indian DHS um, that has a lot of details on child uh, mortality. So more than 600,000 women have been interviewed and that kind of allows us to construct a retrospective birth history because they're asked about all the children, whether or not the child survived. If the child did not survive, they first ask how many, uh, how, when, how many months or, or weeks the baby was at the moment uh, the child passed away. Okay, so then we're using uh, the Indian National Election and Candidates database, which has been put together uh, by Insignius and Vernier. And that gives us all the electoral outcomes. It also gives us a bunch of characteristics of the different uh, candidates. Then we're using the national sample survey from 2009 and 2010. This is to calculate household expenditures and inequality. So this has a total of about 120,000 households. And the district is the, the finest ge ge geographical identifier. So we, of course, then have to map these districts to different constituencies. Sometimes it's very easy if the district completely belongs to a constituency. Of course, if the district belongs to, to several um, constituencies, then what we actually do is we weight by the probability of being in a particular constituency. So we make the assumption that people are equally spread over their district and then we use a weight to, to place the district into different uh, constituencies. So finally, we're also using the census of India of 2001, which gives us uh, details on publicly provided goods. It also gives us a bunch of population characteristics that either we systematically control for or that we're further using in, in some of the robustness checks that we're doing. Okay, so are there any questions before I start uh, digging into the empirical strategy? No, if not, then uh, I'm, I'm going to give you the details of, of our identification. So the main idea of, of, of what we're basically doing is we're comparing the mortality risk of children who are allocated to a new constituency, and we're going to compare the child who is allocated to a new constituency 
to a child who is not allocated to that new constituency, but who is born in the same year, in the same district, and in the same pre-delimitation constituency. Okay, so as you can see on, on the graph, which is, um, which is below that, so um, to the right, so the, the part B post delimitation. So we have two children there. We have the children A and B. So A and B, they are born in the same district, which is indicated by D. They're also born in the same pre delimitation constituency, which was um, A on the left graph. But because of the delimitation, the child A now belongs to post delimitation A prime, and the child B now belongs to post delimitation B prime. Just a quick okay. question. Just a quick question. This uh, the the children are the smaller and not capital A and B, right? And yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I usually I'm used to to show it, but I'm I'm actually pointing at my screen, but that doesn't really help, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Sorry. The children are indeed a small letter A and B. Then the D stands for the district, and then the capital indicates um, indicates the the constituencies. I'm so sorry about this. Yeah. So it's a children A and B. So um, they they belong to the same same districts, but because it's post delimitation, they no longer belong to the same constituency. While imagine that A and B both have a brother. Brother is born right before the the delimitation. So there we have the children C and D. Okay. So the small C and small D. So uh, there's actually no cap, well, there's a capital D. So the small c and the small d are children who are born just before the delimitation. Let's say the exact same villages. So c is born in the same village as a, child d is born in the same village as child b. But before the delimitation, they belong to the same um, constituency, they belong to the same district, and uh, still uh, they are born in the, in the same year. And these type of children, like c and d, we're actually gonna be using as a placebo. Because there's no reason, if, if our whole mechanism is correct, then there's no reason why the mortality of children like C and D should be different, while we're going to show that the mortality of children like A and B are actually different. One clarification, Lauren. So, so the NFHS data, uh, how do you put somebody in the parliamentary constituency? Um, by so, using the district, uh, by using... Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, because it has a GIS information. I had to think for a moment about that. So it has. Yeah, um, the, we have the core. We have the coordinates. Yeah, but you have the coordinates in a five-kilometer radius, right? Yes, exactly. So, so we're. So, so, so they're not displaced uh, district-wise, but it's indeed true that they put an error of five kilometers. So. Basically, there may be some mistakes for children who are at the border between two of the constituencies. That is indeed possible. But, but that's what your post delimitation would be about, right? When the district is breaking up. So your identification would mess up with uh, not having the data at the parliamentary constituency level. So I remember that Anders looked into that at some point. Okay. Uh, what, I mean, what he basically looked into is um, comparing the, uh, the overlap, if you want, of area before okay. and afterwards. And that's actually not, that's, they're not enormous differences if you want in, in, in if you take a look at the average over the different districts. I so see. let's say I... that, that districts are as likely to be in the same delimitation. Of course, they can be in, in a different constituency, but there are no enormous changes in the splitting of the districts. Got it. The, uh, the, that's in a so footnote the... in the paper. God. So the other question I have is, uh, and, uh, delimitation was also mostly the delimitation that you'll be looking at happened in states like UP, the poor states, right? So would that be a certain concern? So I think, I hope that I put a list. Let me actually very quickly take a look at it. Oh, oh, no, I did not put a list. Fine. So we, we actually, so... Um, no, I thought that we had the list of the countries. There are indeed uh, of the states. There are indeed two states that, well, the whole process was done, but then it was never implemented. Um, I know Jarkant is one of the two, but I no, don't remember the second one. So these are obviously out. But if you basically compare the population, because we're going to be taking a look at rural areas, mm -hmm. if you take a look at the rural population that is part of our sample to the full rural population, then we actually have 90%. I see. I see. Okay. So it was Thank broadly you. it was broadly implemented. Okay. So I think it's Yamu and Kashmir who is a second state where where it was not uh, was not implemented. Okay. Um, but otherwise, uh, it was it was basically implemented everywhere. Oh. I have a quick question. 
Yes. Is it fine? Okay, okay. So, yeah, sure. uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, is it possible that the level of uh, political competitiveness is affected by, you know, the power of the rich people and that can mess up with your testing of the hypothesis in some sense? So that's actually exactly what I was going to come to now. So um, l let me explain the next, the next step, which is the other okay, challenge okay, that okay. I have this slide. And I hope that's going to answer your question. If that's not the case, then, uh, then, then definitely let me know. So basically, it's uh, just no, I so, just have one more question. Uh, uh, yes. So there's also the state legislative things that are happening, right? Because this is a long period before you catch them in the NFHS. Mm -hmm. So are there going to be kind of systematic effects because of that also? Because, I mean, this is one level of competition that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But there's presumably other competition that would be happening at the legislative level, uh, which is also changing uh, due to the delimitation, right? Yeah. So you'll see that we, we throw in a bunch of controls, but... Um, and, and, and we have a bunch of horse race regressions that actually try to pick up as much as possible or other correlates that may actually um lead to the or, or be part of, of the effect that we're observing but um in particular for the state we don't have we don't have any any specific control for that the only thing we can say is the district fixed effects that should also capture the state um but but that's basically it so to be honest, if you would be able to get access to um, to the state maps, just as we have them for the parliamentary constituencies, if you would have all the details before and after the limitations, we definitely would love to look into that level as well. But the biggest issue that we have is that we don't have the, the maps available. So, and that is the reason why, I mean, one of the reasons um, in, in terms of whether it matters from a uh, political point of view, both the levels definitely play an important role. So there is the parliament and then there is the states. But then for the parliaments, we actually have the, the exact maps before and after the delimitation, which allows us to see exactly where families have been moving. And that information is not available at the state level. So I agree with you that this would be a nice additional analysis to do. Uh, it would be a nice if you want additional robustness check to actually take a look at changes at the state level, but we don't we don't have that information available. If any of you knows where, where we can get access to that, actually would be that would be great. I know that people are constructing it, but it may take quite some more additional time to actually really get access to it. Okay, so um, thanks for all these comments. By the way, these are um, great challenges of, of the of the paper. So. Um, so we had the child A and B. Uh, so as said, same district, born in the same year, one changes constituency and the other one did not. So in, in line with what Siddharth was, uh, was just asking, one of the problems that we're obviously facing is that if you have a group, let's say we have a group of poorer people A that are suddenly moved to a new constituency that is richer, then actually these people, they may directly influence the political competition, they may directly influence the inequality in their new PC. And this could potentially be, be mechanical, okay? Because if we have a very rich constituency, they, they kind of get an additional part that is very poor, then inequality would, um, would mechanically be going up. So to avoid this um, or, or to, to, to take this into account, what we basically do is we calculate the mean income, we calculate the inequality, we calculate the political competition using the boundaries of the pre-delimitation constituencies. And to define what is a pre-delimitation constituency, we actually take the pre-delimitation that has the highest overlap with the post-delimitation. So this I, means, uh, wait, can, can I, can I yeah. one, sorry, one more minute, just to be sure that, that I finish this block and then, um, then I, I, I take back the, the questions. So basically, so we have the child A who belongs to post-delimitation constituency A prime, Post-delimitation constituency A prime has the highest overlap with pre-delimitation constituency A. So for the child, uh, for the child A, what we're using to calculate, um, to calculate mean income, to calculate inequality, we're going to be using the borders of the pre-delimitation constituency A. For the child B and post-delimitation B prime, we're going to use the information from pre-delimitation B. And then 
and one of the raw business checks, we're not doing this. We're just using A prime and B prime and we're gonna get exactly the same result. But this is just as a starting point to basically take into account that all this reshifting may indeed have important consequences in terms of um, changing uh, income, changing inequality in uh, the post uh, delimitation constituencies. Okay, Sarvesh, there was a question. Yes, yeah, so uh, I was just need a clarification. So the point related to the rich people. So do rich people affect the level of political competition or do they affect the decisions of politicians given the level of political competition? So the second, so we're, we're second, assuming, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, not we're assuming they're not impacting the, the level of political competition, mm -hmm. but basically what they, they, the whole idea is a bit that the, the idea of, of elite capture, if you want, uh, Got it. the whole sense that there are certain public goods that benefit the rich more than they benefit the poor and the other way around. And if there's very few political competition, the, the, the rich may have a lot of influence over the type of, of, of policies that are basically implemented. And then we put forward that public health care may not be part of that yeah. because they could go to private services, which earlier may one be better and they may have access to them. Earlier, I thought that you said that they affect the level of competition. So I just thought to clarify it. Thank you. Yeah, oh, no, sorry. Sorry for that. Okay. So, um, so basically then the last step of the identification, so the, the key identification assumption that we're making here is that the relative mortality risk of the inf infants A and B, which were on the B part of the graph, that is affected by the change in the allocation of the constituencies only. And, and in, other, in other words, what this basically means or what we basically need is that the allocation of households to constituencies within a district that this is as good as um, as random okay and so the first thing we did for that is taking a look at whether at least uh, the delimitation itself is random so that is that is or at least is, is there was no gerrymandering involved into the whole process that is what uh, what i discussed before what we're doing here is first of all we're taking a look at differences in observables between villages who are allocated to new constituencies and those who remain in their original ones uh, a bit like the baseline uh, regression table that you would do if you if you take a look at any experiment. Then we're going to be running placebo tests, as I mentioned, on children like C and D. Okay, so there is no reason why the mortality risk of these kids should be different if they were born before the delimitation took place. Um, and then we run also a bunch of, of horse race regressions where we interact our main variables of interest with other constituency uh, characteristics. And this is mainly uh, to be sure that our constituency level variables, that they're not picking up effects, uh, that other, other correlated uh, changes that may take place at, at the constituency level. Good, so uh, this is the regression. Um, so on the left-hand side, uh, you have the mortality of the infant I that is born in a certain year T in district D and the child belongs to pre-delimitation constituency K, and then the subscript L, that denotes the pre-constituency that the post-constituency is linked to. So basically, if I, to just show it, uh, to be sure that this is clear, so as said before, the mean income inequality for a child A, small a, is um, gonna be calculated using the borders of pre-delimitation A. And the reason why we use pre-delimitation A is because that has the biggest overlap to post-delimitation constituency A prime in which the child is, is now residing. Okay, so this, this additional border is, is important in the, in the understanding of, of our um, empirical uh, strategy. So then of course we, we calculate average income, we estimate the impact of inequality of political competition, but then the most important is gonna be the interaction between political competition and inequality, because the whole idea or our main hypothesis is basically that inequality on its own may have a negative effect on child mortality, but then we believe that a fiercer political competition can actually offset that negative effect. And that is gonna be estimated through the coefficient beta four uh, in this equation. So then we have this uh, district pre-delimitation year fixed effect to be sure that we're actually, I, 
comparing kids and children in a very um, in a very fine grid. And then we also have a bunch of controls at the child level, such as the gender, the religion of the child. And we also have some area characteristics, uh, such as the literacy rate, the population share of uh, SCs and STs, and then the available public amenities prior to the delimitation. Okay, and just one note for the ease of interpretation, we standardized uh, all, um, all the most important variables of interest by subtracting their mean and dividing by their standard deviation. This obviously does not make a difference in, in the impact, but it's just easier to, um, easier to interpret. Uh, um, one, yes. I see. So this comment on this infants uh, who mother moved, right? I mean, I was just coming to that. I see this point here. But in fact, that would make your, uh, your uh, neonatal mortalities to be kind of very noisy, right, in some sense. Because we know that most of these people move intra-district. But because that intra-district basically doesn't mean intra, you know, constituency by the nature of the way it's been set up, right? Mm -hmm. So... So that's why maybe you're not finding those kind of results for, uh, you know, for, for childbirth and stuff like that. So, you, so you're basically thinking that if you would include uh, mothers who move after birth, that it's more likely that we find an effect? Not include, included? not include, but in fact, the fact that you may have this measured with a lot more error, because it could be that you were born somewhere else and so on and so forth, might, you know, might basically get you more error in this case. So it could be that a lot of the care was in fact in some other house but she moved at a I later see, stage I and see. stuff because there's a lot of movement happening before birth right no, yeah, yeah, not yeah, through yeah. post birth yeah 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 no i see i see what you mean yeah but there, there's nothing we can do about that right yeah but there's that nothing. that might explain one of the reasons why you find tighter results as you said in the beginning yeah at uh, the small ones i see yeah thanks we should uh, probably mention that um Okay, so, so the, um, the selection of the samples. So here it is actually here. We, we're looking at the 15 largest states of India. So that's 90% of the total rural uh, population. We excluded PCs that are all urban, uh, basically for two reasons. The first one that, that it's very unlikely that there is a change in these constituencies. So our identification strategy does not really work. And then uh, secondly, because um, we don't have all the information needed to actually run or to include them into, into the sample. So, and then we indeed exclude infants for who the mother moved after their birth. And the main reason is, is to just be sure or surer that we allocate them to the right, uh, to the right village. And also for that reason, mothers who are a visitor in the location where she was uh, interviewed. Because as Abirup said, if they actually go somewhere else for the care, then we, uh, we they basically don't know where exactly, what exactly the constituency is they fall under. So in total, this leads to a sample of uh, 447 pre-delimitation uh, political constituencies. So a bit of details on, um, a bit of details on the variables of interest. So uh, in terms of mortality, so we have neonatal mortality, which we estimate as death before the first month. So the theoretical definition is that within the first uh, four weeks, so the first 28 days. But then as uh, Sonia Balotra has been pointing out in some of her work, there's a lot of age heaping. And for that reason, we include up to the first month. Um, then post neonatal infant mortality is that between one and, and 12 months of age. Um, and this I already discussed before because of the question of SOM. So we distinguish between the two types of mortality as the policies that are needed to reduce them are likely to be different. So um, basically just to quickly repeat that, neonatal mortality, what would be needed is a lot of individual clinical care. While for post-neonatal infant mortality, it's, it's somehow easier to actually avoid if you want uh, children, children dying, basically because the main reasons are diarrhea, pneumonia, uh, and then there are a bunch of vaccines that, that, that can prevent uh, major diseases. Um, we construct binary variables that take value one if the child died, died zero if the, the child did not pass away, provided that the child was fully exposed to the mortality concept. So imagine that the child was born five months before the end of the period, then the child would be included in neonatal mortality, but not in post-neonatal mortality, because we're not sure that the child made it up to, uh, up to 12 months. Uh, this is something that is standard done within, within this literature. Um, for political competition, the first measure that we're actually using is one minus the Herfindel-Hirschman index, but then 
as you will see, we have a number of different measures that we use for political competition. For inequality, the main one that we're using is the Gini coefficient, but then again, uh, there are a bunch of, of other measures that we, that we use, and, and you'll see those results in a minute. So um, here comes actually the results. So if you take a look at the first lines in this table, so there you see the share of, of neonatal and postneonatal infant mortality. And it's indeed, it's indeed the case that uh, that it's higher for neonatal uh, infant mortality there. It's about 3% while it is, uh, well, 3.4% and it's only 1.3% if you want for um, post neonatal infant uh, mortality. So it's indeed the case that one is a little bit higher than, than the other. Um, then uh, Gini coefficient, uh, what's important here is a standard deviation because given we standardized all our coefficient, when we start interpreting the coefficient, we're playing with the standard deviation of the Gini coefficient, which is uh, 6.2, um, and the, the other variables are uh, slightly less uh, Just one uh, clarification yes. in the last slide. What is S, this one minus S, the S is what? Yes, S-C-I uh, or? And, um, so here it's uh, the share, sorry, that's actually a very important question. It's the share of votes that a particular candidate had. And for a certain uh, constituency, and then okay. L refers to the the the, uh, the pre delimitation constituency that overlaps with with the constituency in which the child is currently based. So it's a share of votes of the candidates, and it's actually good that you're asking this question, because that's um, also something we've been been playing a little bit with. So at the moment, we're taking a look at the ten most important candidates. Uh, because Indian Indian elections, you, you have actually a bunch of, of, of candidates, but then the shares become extremely small. So um, also one thing that we do is what happens if we're only taking a look at the five most important candidates, uh, to just be sure that we're, we're not creating a measure that, that, that basically blows up with, with very tiny candidates. Of course, political, this measure of political competition takes that into account to a certain extent, but not all other, other measures do that. And if you take a look within um, the first 10 candidates, you will actually see that there's no competition within parties. So of all the parties, there would only be one candidate in, in the first 10, and then a group of independent candidates that, mm -hmm. that run for that particular um, election. So just one uh, small point on this. So uh, the way a political competition is measured, so it is possible that in one constituency, there are 10 candidates who are like uh, fighting. And in one constituency, there are only two candidates. But exactly. in the latter, you can still have a higher competition than the former. Exactly, exactly. That's the case. So, yeah. So, no, that thanks. is that is indeed the case. So it does not, I mean, this measure does not really control for the number of candidates that you have, mm -hmm. but some of the other measures actually do. Okay, okay. Um, so so the... this is just one, and, and I'll show you in a minute the other. Okay. Okay. We also Thank take you. a look at the vote share um, of the winner. Um, we take a look at the difference between the first and the second, and we also take a look at the effective number of candidates, and that actually takes that into account. Effective number would be yeah, is in some yeah. Sense. That is the last one that we're we're taking a look at, oh. and the results the results uh, remain Thank remain you. the same. Okay, so the, the, first, uh, the first result here is, is basically the balance check. I'm just checking, okay, I have 12 more minutes. So, uh, I mean, this is basically showing that if you compare villages that were moved to new constituency with villages that stayed in the same constituency, you basically see that there are no observable, uh, observable differences. Okay, so which, which allows me to get into, into the results. So the first results are for neonatal mortality. So as said, um, what we would expect is, is basically on, on the interaction term of inequality and political competition to see a negative, uh, a negative sign, that is, that is the hypothesis of our model. But uh, this is not the case. So there is no impact of our main variables of uh, interest on neonatal mortality. I'm not going to be showing this. So these are the main results. We also did the placebo test where we're comparing the children C and D. So children living in the same district pre-delimitation uh, in um, pre delimitation constituency born in the same year but before the delimitation we also don't see any difference there so there's basically nothing going on if it comes to neonatal mortality 
Here are the results with uh, respect to post-neonatal mortality. And there you actually see that, that the interaction term is indeed negative and, and, and significant. So uh, to give you an idea of, of the importance of, of the effect. So first of all, if um, political competition is, is, is at its average level, then you basically see that there is no impact of inequality. Okay, because otherwise, um, so I said before, all the, all the different variables are standardized. So the impact of inequality here is the impact of inequality if political competition is at its average level. And there you see that there's no impact of inequality. So if on the other hand, political competition is one standard deviation below the sample mean, then a one standard deviation increase in the Gini, which is the same as 6.2 percentage point, that leads to an increase in postneonatal infant mortality of 0 0.18 percentage point. Okay, so that is actually 13% of the sample mean. So it's actually quite an important impact that, um, that, we, are, uh, that we are observing here. Okay, so um, then we run this placebo regression. So it's basically comparing the children C and D instead of the children A and B into the graphs. And you basically see that the effect is, is gone. And the coefficients are actually small and, and not even close to being statistically significant. Okay, so we do see that if we compare children born before the delimitation, that we don't have this effect at all. It's only coming up after uh, the delimitation. So here, as, as it was asked before, so here, is, um, here are the, the other measures of political competition. So one minus the vote share we use, one minus the margin of victory, and then the effective number of parties, which is a number that goes from uh, one, and it's one if, if one party basically takes all the votes, up to the maximum, the highest number that it can take is the total number of candidates. Uh, in our case, that would be equal to, to 10 if, if, there, if there are 10 candidates in, in the constituency. And it would take the value of 10 if each of these 10 people get exactly the same share of, of the votes. Okay, so each of these measures uh, imply a higher value. There is a higher level of, of political competition. And indeed, the effective number of parties, the nice thing there is that even if you would include all these tiny, um, all these candidates with a tiny vote, uh, vote share, it would actually not really matter. Um, it would not take any value into, into the measure. Okay, and we actually see that, that uh, the, results, uh, the results hold. It's no longer significant for one minus the margin of victory, but you do see that the coefficient is actually still, uh, still quite important. So it's, it's less precisely measured, but still around, around the same size. But um, it also implies that it's the political competition has something to do with entry of or existence of multiple candidates, at least in the pivotal set. I mean... And of course, there are many candidates who will just stand just like that. But I mean, there must be a minimum set in which, you know, they, each of these vote shares are kind of important. And uh, this seems to, because the margin of victory is just the, for the winner minus the, the runner. Exactly. Right? So it would kind of tend to imply that basically your political competition seems to come from these multiple members. Who, so it's, who if, there, we, right? if you restrict further the number of candidates, like if you go from 10 to 5, the results are actually not changing. So then, so if you further restrict it, like, I mean, and that would mainly imply taking out a lot of the um, independent people who run, you actually see that, that there is not much changing. No, that's, no, I didn't mean the 10 to 5. What I meant was typically many, many papers, the win margin is the one that people use where yeah. they kind of feel the top two kind of matter and that's where the political mm. competition is. I'm yeah, just saying yeah, the yeah. results seem to imply that it's not these top two, but in fact, it's this, maybe the existence of the third or fourth. We yeah, that make a, to make a difference to the yeah, political yeah, yeah. competition. So, do you have a sense of where, what, by how many candidates is the you know is their vote share pivotal that would change the election outcomes and so on? No, no idea. Yeah. We've not we've not looked into that. I think it would might be worth looking at actually. But we can take a look. Uh, we can take a look at that. It's like, is there an optimal number of? Yeah, just to of get convincing a sense of candidates, what, of candidates that really get play a role into the... Yeah, to understand what this political competition means and where it's coming from, basically. Yeah. Mm. No, thanks. We can, take, we can yeah. take a look into that. So then we do exactly the same exercise for inequality um, by using the ratio of top 10 to the lower 10, um, the mean log deviation, the tail index, and if at all, actually the results become, become a bit stronger. So it's definitely not the case that it was the particular measure of inequality being the Gini that made, made a difference here. So then, then the next thing we do in the robustness check is, is running these horse race regressions. 
Um, and the idea here is that the interaction term, it's, maybe it picks up other factors that are correlated with inequality and political competition. And therefore, what we do is we interact inequality and political competition with several constituency level characteristics. Okay, so in column one, we're interactions with mean expenditure, in column two with urbanization, column three with population, the share of SCs, the share of STs, literacy. And you basically see that it leaves uh, the results unchanged. If we include all of them at the same time, which of course becomes an extremely demanding uh, regression, then you actually see again that the it becomes less precisely estimated, but the size of the coefficient is still very similar. If we, what is what we do in the last column eight, include um, interactions with all the other controls that we had in our main regression, so the area level controls and the child level controls, then we also see that, that, that there is not that much of a change. Again, it becomes a bit less precisely estimated, but uh, these, these regressions are actually extremely demanding. Um, to be honest, when, when we run them for the first time, I was also I mean, I was honestly even rather surprised that the results were that stable throughout, um, throughout these extremely demanding, demanding regressions. Um, then uh, some other robustness checks that we did, so calculating mean expenditures and inequality, not using this pre the borders of the pre-delimitation uh, constituency that overlaps with the one in which they're currently residing, but really using the post-delimitation boundaries uh, that keeps the, keeps the results. We also added dummies for the five largest political parties in 2009, mainly to see if this may have to do more with maybe the, the, the political program really than anything else that, 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 uh, than, than the mechanisms that we put forward does not make any difference. And then we also add controls for the reservation status um, to see if that may be driving the results. And, and that's again, uh, not the case. Okay, so this is, so far, everything we could come up with as, as a robustness check. So let me use the last four minutes to uh, dig a bit in the mechanisms and, and, and into the discussion. I mean, the story is kind of, is kind of set and this is all additional evidence to show um, where these results may be coming from. So basically what we're doing is we're taking a look at the reduced form. We're saying that political competition inequality matters for healthcare outcomes, but obviously that must be going through the supply and or the demand for, um, for uh, public health care. And that's, that's the first thing that we're looking at in, in this table. So in the first column, basically, uh, we're taking a look at the demand for public health care. And what we're finding here is that um, in line with, 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 uh, with what we've discussed so far, is that um, if political competition is one standard deviation, again, below the mean, so we're always taking a look at the same comparison, then an increase in inequality actually increases the likelihood that uh, people state that they have a preference for public health care. So in these areas where we see that there is a lower child mortality, we also see that there is a higher demand for public health care. Okay, if we then take a look at the supply side, we're, we're creating three indicators. Uh, the first one is the SAV, the second one is um, services, and the third one is again services. So the staff are taking a look um, at, it's the average of indicators, whether there's a doctor, a nurse, and a midwife. So if it would take value three, um, the average, sorry, if it takes value one, then it means that these three um, staff are, are available in uh, a local healthcare center. Then services one is actually focusing on neonatal healthcare. Um, and services two is focusing on post-neonatal healthcare. So as, as pointed out earlier when Soma asked the question, so it's not the case that we're not seeing any difference in terms of the efforts that are done to improve neonatal healthcare. It's just that we don't see neonatal healthcare itself changing. And basically what we've been putting forward is that it's, it's just much, it's much harder. Um, so the services included in service one are, for example, whether the woman is registered in the first uh, trimester, whether the delivery can happen at the local health clinic, whether there is postnatal care, um, etc. And then services two is whether there is treatment provided for diarrhea, for pneumonia, whether there are vaccines given for polio, for a um, bunch of, of other diseases. Okay, so that this hints a bit in the direction of of the whole uh, impact that we're finding is actually going both through demand and supply of, um, of public, uh, public health care. So, I mean, this is kind of the, 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 final, the final point that I want to make, make um, is after doing this whole exercise with healthcare, we started discussing that, that, well, if it's the case for one social provision program for the poor, it must be the case for other programs as well. So basically what we do, did is we started digging into uh, MGN Rega, 
and uh, from the public data portal, we got uh, information for the financial years 2011 till 2014. And the information that we have is, first of all, the number of workers, uh, second, the amount disbursed, so which is the supply or that we can consider as the supply of um, of Enrega work. And then in the final col column, we also take a look at the number of households that are demanding for work. Because if there is a change, if we're observing a change in Enrega, the question is, is it because there was not sufficient supply or is it because there was uh, actually a different demand? And as you can see from the last column, it seems not to be demand driven. So it's not the case that in certain areas there was a higher demand for Enrega work than in other areas. But we do see that the number of workers is actually higher in areas where um, inequality is, uh, where political competition is fiercer combined with, um, with, with lower in inequality. And exactly the same for, uh, for the amounts disbursed. So we do see that that impact is, um, is there for other um, social provisions as well. So basically, well, just what I said, so we argue that inequality when combined with the lack of political competition, that this may erode support for public provision of basic healthcare and uh, in Rega. Uh, we provide a basically reduced form evidence on infant mortality, exploiting the redistricting that took place in India. And then we find large effect on post-neonatal, no effect on neonatal mortality. Um, basically, once more putting forward that we feel that it is because they're easily preventable diseases for post-neonatal children, but not for uh, neonatal. Um, that's, um, yeah, no, that's, that's it on my side. Um, I don't know if there, there's time for more questions, I guess, no? That's the... Yeah, so, yeah, so let, let's open the floor, actually. Uh, we'll get about five, six minutes of questions. So uh, so let's start. Um, Siddharth, you wanted want to ask a question? Start. But there are some questions on the chat box, so those can also... Yeah, sir, sir, you can proceed with them first. Okay, Aditya, you had a question or I can read it out? Sorry, I've not been taking a look at the chat yeah. box at all. So, no. so I, I Aditya is also... On the, so let me just ask his, his, his question is, are fertility rates similar across both types of constituencies? Uh, so we've taken a look at the total population, but we've not taken a look at the fertility rates actually. Uh, okay. We'd have to look into that. So it would be the total number of children born after post delimitation basically. Is that what you have in mind? Uh, he has his audio is not working, but I guess that's what he has in mind. I mean, yeah, no, we've, we've not looked at that. Okay. Uh, there's another question by Abhishek. Uh, if he can log in, we can ask the question directly. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so I was just thinking about the, the interaction effect you were looking at and whether this the, the effect size would increase if you just look at constituencies where mostly state or uh, localized state parties compete. Uh, I mean, where you don't have many, uh, many of those. So in the South, at least you would mostly have localized uh, parties like the DMK and the ADMK competing or like the PRS competing with the TDP. So you have more, mostly localized competition and generally I think the margins are much lower for victories. So would you expect there to be uh, an increase for this same provision is what I was, I mean, I was thinking yeah. about it. So what you have in mind is kind of running a heterogeneous effect where we classify yes. constituencies yes. depending on, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So I have, uh, I have no idea as of now, but it's definitely something interesting to look at. Um, Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. Any, anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. Okay, uh, so my question is, uh, I'm trying to understand, uh, why was this delimitation done in the first place? So it's done to equalize the population within constituencies. And, and it actually started, this, it's, it happened yeah. every 10 years till the 1970s, then it was put on hold, and then they did one again in 2008. Okay, so I, I mean, uh, my intent for asking this question was just to see whether you know, the timing and the reasons for doing this, uh, they don't have any feedbacks in mind on your identification. I mean, I hope that is not the case. Right? No, I mean, that's, that's basically, I mean, we hope that to, to, to exclude that worry by uh, basically taking a look at, at whether this was 
as exogenous as it can be. Um, of course, there are limitations and what you can what you can take a look at, but g given the reason why they do the delimitation, so which is to equalize the population, if you then actually take a look at what happened through the delimitation, then that that seems exactly be, be the case. So it seems that they're implementing what um, what they were what they were after. So they obtained what they wanted to what they wanted to obtain. Um, I'm trying to find that slide back. But so it's um, yeah. So that's yeah. That's basically what we what we did what we did here. Anyone else? Yeah, I can ask. Uh, yeah. So uh, so in this in your talk the the um, the level of a political competition so that affects the provisioning of public good and that affects the health outcome. So exactly. in the so in the public provisioning of goods so mainly. You had uh, the uh, the uh, public provisioning related to the health, like good exactly. hospital. So so uh, so now uh, I want to ask that where the somewhat uh, for my own understanding, where the story of education to some extent, which can affect can fit. For example, so one can say that suppose if I take a, a constituency which has a higher inequality so there are more poor so they are like there and so they are less likely to be educated and their health choices and their uh, 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 hygiene level may not be the appropriate one so they are m more likely to have a postnatal child uh, deaths so how mm -hmm. that story is it cover or how can it be like explain or is it so just your thought on that for my own mm. understanding so in theory we could probably take a look at whether it has an impact on education on education as well um so so the main way in which it is if you want control for is because of the district fixed effects i mean if you think it is reasonable to assume that within a district uh, the provision of education is is going to be similar, or at least it was similar before uh, before the delimitation, because it's it's the mothers who will. Um, if you want the mothers of these children, they and the fathers of these children, they belong to the same constituency mm -hmm. uh, before the delimitation took place. So, so they it, are it, likely the to have of the parents, similar education. That's I mean, yeah, that's what I would put forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you buy that argument. Um, of course, there can be there can be a change in in, in the next generations. Uh, if you want, if if there is an impact on education as well, just as we find on health and on enrega, then it is definitely the case that this is another road comparable that may be that may be impacted. But the best argument that I can put in there, not be, education, not uh, playing a role here, is that that the parents of these children basically belong to the same district the same constituency um, at the moment they went to school given that we include excluded uh, women who have been moving after birth well could bring in differences before birth uh, one thing i think that we could take a look at is the education level of the dhs should have probably some details about the education level of of the mothers that is something that we could take a look at okay thank you and given the timing of the delimitation, that was uh, that was deterministic, right? It was decided. Exactly, I mean, exactly. But yeah. people, I mean, the poor people, they did not know that they would be, you know, uh, they would be in a different group or something. No, Is that, no, uh, no, no. Yeah. No, exactly. That's kind of important, right? For mm. uh, any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I have one question. So this is similar to uh, Aditya's question. Um, are the levels of, say, institutional births uh, the same across these two different types of constituencies? So that that I don't know. We we should we would have to take a look into that. So uh, the reason I'm asking is one of the uh, main reasons why uh, neonatal mortality. I mean, you could be seeing different rates, uh, different results between neonatal and post neonatal mortality. Is a lot of neonatal mortality was due to home birth. And um, rather than you know institutional birth, so uh, during this time period, there was also a policy to promote institutional birth. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I, it could be sort of clouding your results. With the, so, but that, that would basically explain, okay, so that would be an, an alternative explanation for not finding an impact on neonatal births, right. is what you're, what, you're, what you're saying, I see. Um, so yeah, so we've, we've not looked at, at actually the share of institutional births and the numbers, the absolute numbers we've not taken a look at. So the only, we've only been taking a look at whether there is a, mid, uh, whether there is a midwife and births, we, we've included dummies, we've not included shares or if that is available, well, we should be able to calculate that because we should know where the children were, were born. But we've not yet, we've not yet looked into that. Okay, one, two more questions. Uh, maximum. Thanks. Yeah. Any, anything else? Anyone else? Okay, maybe I've scared people with two more questions. Any more questions? Uh, Aditya has a follow-up. She says, I missed the initial part of the talk, but one comment suggestion that I have is one could explore the impact on various subgroups like SCST and the inequality measure could be measured by a between group measure of inequality. That's, it's a comment, it's not a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, then let me ask mm-hmm. one last question. Since, so, I mean, you know, one of the results that we always see in development is that while political economy seems to have a lot of impact on employment and so on and so forth, the evidence on health and education are typically not as strong. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that people point out is this, you know, the fact that, you know, one is of course one of attribution, right? And this is a, you know, Health is a, a subject that both the state as well as the center essentially work on. So, I mean, what would political parties get out of doing all these good things if basically state governments can take you know credit? Uh, and if the, if it's not aligned, then it's not sure, it's not clear that it's in the interest or it gives any benefit to a political party to be able to do this. So, I'm just wondering, you know, do you have anything in mind and why you know? in spite of not there being that much evidence on this, why you find this evidence? I mean, it's just that they want to do good. Is it a functioning? Is it, uh, you know? No, that, that's, that's a very good point. So, and I think that the on, only answer, I mean, that, that's also why that particular literature was very important for us to, to just defend the fact that we're looking at, uh, at members of parliament. But it seems to be the case that, that uh, people get in touch with with these members of parliament. So they seem to be spending indeed a considerable amount of time with the constituents, um, which and that's probably also the reason why, I mean, these two people with 30 years apart, well, actually more 50 years apart have been revisiting exactly the same, the same, uh, the same question of how important are these people in terms of getting in touch with, with, with local constituents. And they seem to actually be doing that. So I guess that they must feel that that that, that gives them a benefit um, or, or increases the likelihood of being re-elected. Because, uh, you know, just to follow but up... We, we don't know. We don't have details from these members of parliament themselves. We only know... I mean, we could take a look at the speeches. We've been reading up the literature to see if they indeed play a role into local politics, and that seems to be the case. But how that then exactly translates indeed into visibility, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, just to follow up, you know, the level of political competition and, for example, uh, elections just one level lower, the MLAs, is intense in India. I mean, you know, it's the win margins are minuscule. And yet, you know, you can look at states like Bihar, UP, where all these win margins are, in fact, quite close, but they have, they have extremely poor health, right? Uh, you know, we know the health facilities are very bad. So I'm just wondering, I mean, so one of the standard things people have said is it's not worth investing in these things because, you know, who will be, and first, then there are long gestation period goods also. Mm. So I'm just wondering, I'm the kind of, to have a, a reason why, uh, for example, would you see impacts of this on the next election? Uh, in, <laughs> and so on and so forth? I mean, no, that's, that's a good, I mean, we would, the, the main problem is that we would probably not be able to identify it, but it, mm. it may be worth actually taking a look at, uh, taking a look at least at the correlations uh, to see if, if, this, if this continues. Um, no, that's, I mean, that's a good, and that's, that's, also, that's also a very fair point. Um, the, the, the only things we can bring in is that it seems that they actually play a role also given that they have this particular budget. Um, and then an important, an important part of that budget seems to be to invest into local healthcare. 
and that that may go back to something being visible um that may be the reason why that's that's where they place the focus but then at the same time we also see it for Enrega. so right. anyway so uh no so no it's a very good point no no clear i mean th there's actually i mean there's 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 some literature written on on the motivations of these people but um but it's true that that, that it's still a limited literature so to, to get exact details about about how, how I mean, their time spending has been looked at, mm -hmm. but then more details about what their priorities are and, and why they care exactly about local levels. That's, um, we, should, we should find some sociologists or political scientists to work on that. Um, okay, so uh, the way it'll work is so the seminar is over. Uh, so thank you everyone for being there and thanks uh, Lord, for a great talk. Uh, Laura, if you can, so there are some students who uh, who fixed some slot to talk to you. Mm -hmm. So, so apart from them, uh, you know, can the others log off? Uh, and thanks for coming, everyone.